have it. And here's what World Food Club have been reading. It's called Such a Fun Age. I wanted to use familiar stereotypes, but twist and bend them a bit. I'm Harriet Gilbert, and joining me to answer questions about it from BBC listeners around the world. That's a wonderful question. You turned me inside out with that one today. <laughs> it's an American author. Read World Fits Club at bbcworldservice.com slash Club. This is the BBC World Service, and on our website, you can explore more of our programs from documentaries to science. Listen and download at any time by going to bbcworldservice.com. Online and on smartphones, this is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Marshall. Ukraine says Russian forces have bombed a maternity and children's hospital in the southern port city of Mariupol. Wow, the bold face in the middle of uh, children's hospital. The British ambassador to Ukraine, now in Poland, tells us the Russian invasion is a horror show. What progress have Russian forces made over the past two weeks? And we'll speak to a former advisor to President Putin. What would it take for the Russian leader to call off the assault? Also in Antarctica, scientists have found one of the greatest ever undiscovered shipwrecks more than a hundred years after it sank. It is in a magnificent shape, the gold lettering of endurance today. When we saw that, we just, it was emotional. People were hugging and shouting. It was, it was great. But that's all after the latest news. BBC News, with Ukraine has accused Russia of bombing a maternity and children's hospital in the besieged city of Mariupol. President Vladimir Zelensky called it an atrocity. A regional governor said 17 people have been hurt. More details from our chief international correspondent, Lee Sussan, in Kiev. The president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has leveled this accusation against Russia, saying it was a deliberate strike and that women and children are buried under the wreckage. We still are trying to establish whether or not or how many children were in the hospital at the time. The images are very distressing. The whole section of the hospital is now a charred shell. We saw rooms turned topsy-turvy, windows shattered, walls smashed, children's furniture turned upside down. If it was a deliberate strike, that is a war crime. A short time earlier, the Russian foreign ministry said Ukrainian fighters had moved staff and patients out of the hospital and set up firing positions there. There have been further setbacks and efforts to evacuate civilians from other areas under attack by Russia, despite an agreement to have a 12-hour ceasefire. Ukrainian officials accused Russian troops of shelling the eastern town of Izium, stopping buses from leaving. The Russian government has admitted that conscripts have been used in the invasion of Ukraine, despite a promise by President Putin that only professional soldiers would take part. The defense ministry said some of them had been captured. From Moscow, Jenny Hu. It feels as though it's getting harder for the Kremlin to maintain that everything is going according to plan, which of course is what they had been insisting about their so-called special military operation in Ukraine. Just a few days ago, they had to admit that Russian soldiers are dying as part of this mission. And then today, the Defense Ministry admitted that young conscripts had been sent in. So the Kremlin is seeking to keep control over what's happening because a lot of Russians watch state television. They are being told that the Kremlin has everything under control. Western officials say they're very concerned about the possibility of Russia using non-conventional weapons in the ongoing invasion of Ukraine. The time is used to cover a variety of biological and nuclear devices, but it's understood the officials are referring to chemical warfare. Our security correspondent is Gordon Carrera. The expectation is that this really refers to chemical weapons. They're not saying it's definitely going to be used, but they are clearly expressing a kind of growing concern about it. The evidence for that, they pointed to the fact it had been used before in the conflicts Russia had been involved in, notably Syria, of course. Also, the fact that there'd been some kind of disinformation and claims coming from Russia, potentially, in their words, setting the scene for it, what they called a false flag possibility. BBC News. 
South Korea's presidential election has been narrowly won by the conservative opposition leader, Yoon Sung Yeol. In one of the tightest races in the country's recent history, he beat the governing Democratic Party candidate, Lee Jae Yeol, by less than one percentage point. Flora Bicker reports from Seoul. Yoon Suk Yeol only entered politics last year and rose to prominence by successfully prosecuting the former conservative president, Park Geun Hye, on bribery and corruption charges. His victory marks the end of a bitterly divided contest with his liberal rival. He's pledged to abolish the Ministry of Gender Equality and blame the rise of feminism for the country's low birth rate. Mr Yoon is also more hawkish on foreign policy than the current leader, Moon Jae-in. One of Brazil's best-known musicians, Caetano Veloso, is leading a protest outside Congress in Brasilia against planned laws which he says would cause widespread environmental destruction. The bill for them, on other things, openly to mining on indigenous land. The draft legislation is backed by President Jair Bolsonaro. During his time in office, deforestation of the Amazon has accelerated sharply. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said he believes the visit to Turkey by his Israeli counterpart, Isaac Herzog, marks a turning point in relations between the two countries after a decade of tension. Relations have been strained since 2010, when Israeli commandos killed 10 Turkish activists heading by boat to Gaza. President Herzog said mutual respect would allow the countries to deal with shared challenges. A critically endangered species of bat has been discovered in Rwanda's Nyungwe forest after lasting crisis 40 years ago. The pair of hill horseshoe bats were first found in a cave in 2019, but it took two years to verify the species. BBC News. Welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service, coming to you live from our studios in central London. I'm Julian Marshall. And we begin our coverage of Ukraine today in the southern port city of Mariupol, where according to the government, a maternity and children's hospital has been bombed by the Russians with reports of deaths and injuries. Images on social media show a huge crater and wrecked buildings. There's meant to be a ceasefire in Mariupol, but it's been relentlessly bombarded since the beginning of the invasion two weeks ago. Life for the residents there is already one of extreme privation. According to the deputy mayor, there's no water, electricity or gas, while people are melting snow to drink. The White House has described today's attack on the hospital as barbaric. And uh, earlier, the director general of the World Health Organization, Pedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, said that healthcare providers had increasingly been caught up in attacks in the conflict in Ukraine. So far, WHO has verified 18 attacks on health facilities, health workers and ambulances, including 10 deaths and 16 injuries. These attacks deprive whole communities of health care. WHO continues to call on the Russian Federation to commit to a peaceful resolution to this crisis. Well, shortly before we came on air, I spoke to Petro Andrushchenko, who's an advisor to the mayor of Mariupol. He left the city last night to organize humanitarian corridors, and it's a few kilometers outside Mariupol. We have four bombs in the center of our historical part of the city, and one of the bombs is in the middle of a uh, children's hospital. All we got blown up because it's very, very powerful. We use this hospital like hospital for children, and our children in this hospital stayed all day long. And we near the second building in this hospital when our children born. Were there casualties? So now we found 17 accounted uh, women, for lucky, uh, 18 children, uh, but we rock uh, and rock because we will know all the real picture with uh, the destroying with our people, with killed and accounted uh, just in the morning. So for the moment you know that 17 women have been injured, but you yeah. don't know the full scale of the casualties. Yeah. Are there any military targets close to the hospital? It's 
absolutely civilian part of the city. We haven't any military, any forces near the building and near our civilian structure. And there's meant to be a ceasefire in Mariupol at the moment, is that right? The Mariupol is under the fire is, I don't know, minute by minute now. It's terrible. Our buildings are destroyed. Our streets are destroyed. Uh, we have uh, fire around and we can't uh, do anything with, with this problem. We haven't electricity, we haven't water, we haven't uh, heat. It's a catastrophe. Is anybody able to leave the city? Is, it, is, it, is anybody Anyone. able to get out? Nobody. No, no one. Because of the Russian controlled all uh, our roads for exit from the city and if the civilian people try to exit they start to attack they start to the fire from fire guns so our people really stay stay inside the city like hostage as i know our government will try to talk to russian government and they but they they promised to stop the fire and give us uh, a humanity corridor but it's absolutely right day by day they lie and steal us that's the rhyme there is tenka advisor to the mayor of maria paul i've also been speaking to our chief international correspondent at least you said in the capital of kiev what was she hearing about the attack on the hospital in maria paul well, judging by the videos that have been posted, the first one was by Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president. A children's hospital and maternity ward were turned upside down by the force of the blast. Windows were shattered, walls were smashed. One section of the hospital was a charred shell, so a lot of damage. But there is a huge crater, massive crater, in the yard of that hospital, suggesting that that is where the, the bomb, the missile, actually landed. So the big question is always, was this deliberate, deliberate targeting of hospitals is a war crime? Was it a mistake? How many were killed? We still don't know. The earlier figure said 17 were injured, including uh, women in labor. But we don't know yet of how many children are there, even though President Zelensky accused Russia of deliberately targeting uh, the children's hospital and the maternity ward and burying, in his words, women and children under the wreckage. The residents of Mariupol have been trying unsuccessfully to get out of the city. Where else in Ukraine today these have people been able to get out? So there were six humanitarian corridors, green channels as they're called, but they are partly green or pure or clean. If some civilians were able for a second day to leave the northeastern city of Sumy, it's very close to the Russian border. 7,000 people were able to leave yesterday despite sporadic Russian fire, including hundreds of international students. We heard that more people have been able to leave today. President Zelensky welcomed that, but said that it amounted only to 1% of the population that was desperate to leave what has been incessant Russian shelling. But around Mariupol, as we have been saying, as well as a place called Idium near Kharkiv in the northeast, there was too much shelling for people to be taken out safely. Are these temporary ceasefires expected to continue? We're expecting that tonight at some point we'll hear from the Russian Defense Ministry to say that yet again tomorrow there will be a ceasefire from 9 in the morning till 9 at night to show that Russia is committed to help civilians at the time of war. Ukrainians will again try to ensure that this happens. The Red Cross and other aid agencies are all at the ready with their trucks with bringing food and other supplies into the siege areas and trying to get residents out. They won't give up, but Ukraine needs more. Where you are, these in the capital, Kiev, is it still a city besieged? It's eerily quiet in the city centre. It's a city centre which, with every day, becomes more and more fortified. More soldiers on the streets, more sandbags piled up, tires, more anti-tank barriers, more sight barriers try to prevent the entry of that armored column that has been sitting ominously 40 miles long on the edge of the city. But there is heavy fighting on the outskirts of the city. There are explosions in the city every day. We begin the day and end the day with air raid sirens. 
We saw today ground air missiles being fired by the Ukrainian forces, underlining again that even as this military campaign by the mighty Russian army is in its third week, Ukrainian air power remains intact. But the big question on everyone's mind is, are Russian forces actually going to enter this city? And is there any way to bring an end to this war? That's the BBC's uh, Lisa Dussat speaking to me earlier from Kiev. And uh, shortly before that attack on the hospital in uh, Mariupol, the Russian Foreign Ministry says that Ukrainian fighters have moved staff and patients out of the hospital and set up firing positions there. But it's two weeks since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine from the east, the north and the south. They've advanced into the country, seizing territory and have been bombarding towns and cities. Uh, but what progress have Russian forces made over the past 14 days? Henry Boyd is the research fellow for defense and military analysis at the International Institute for Strategic Studies here in London. I think at the moment we've seen a, that's a pause in the progress of Russia's military operations. Certainly since the end of last week, there's been very little comparative progress by Russia's um, combat forces inside Ukraine. Whether this is indicative of a, of a, a stalemate military situation or perhaps more of a genuine operation pause, it's difficult to say with any confidence. We have two kind of key unknown factors at the moment, uh, one of which is the Kremlin leadership's willingness to scale back its war aims in an effort to sort of pursue an off-ramp to the conflict as it stands, or perhaps even the Russian military's ability to make better use of its remaining military resources in the Ukraine than we've seen so far. We haven't really seen very much evidence of either to date, but at some point Russia's leadership, Putin in particular, is going to have to, to be able to reconcile the, the uh, fundamental tension between political aims and um, maybe his more limited military capacity. And do you think that it's because that advance has stalled that the Russians have now moved uh, to this other strategy of bombarding uh, cities and, and towns in, in order to um, intimidate uh, the, the, the local population? I think that's certainly a reasonable assumption to draw. Um, I think the, the limited success of their initial operation approach, very firepower light, depends on speed and achieving a quick turnover, has given way to a much more traditional, I put it this way, Russian military approach. Their only realistic aim of, achi of achieving their maximal war aims currently would be to, to, to break the psychological will of the Ukrainian population generally to resist. And this much more destructive, collateral damage heavy approach, and maybe an exhaustion of some of the other options potentially in the Russian toolkit. On the other hand, it, this may simply be um, preparatory work if what Russia is, what the Russian high command is currently doing is regrouping its remaining force and is taking time to attempt to fix some of the supply, logistics, maintenance, rear area security issues that have dogged the Russians so far. And perhaps what you're seeing now is a, a, an interim tempo operation by the Russians to sustain pressure in the meantime. Much has been made of the, the resistance that uh, Ukrainian forces are uh, putting up. I mean, does that involve uh, this, the destruction of tanks and armoured personnel carriers, the downing of aircraft? There is much less reporting intentionally on Ukrainian movements and tactics. But I think you can see, look at, looking at the results, whether part of the initial campaign plan or an adaption to circumstances, an increasing focus by the Ukrainians on attacking Russian columns and convoys en route, ambushing them, um, focusing on Russian support and supply capabilities, and as, as more information becomes available about the difficulties Russia is experiencing in terms of logistics and maintenance, an increasing effort being made by the Ukrainians to play into that, as it were, and target Russian fuel supply in particular on the roads. And the question then becomes how sustainable that, that is. Can Russia provide security for its, for its convoys and columns on the move? Whether Russia is, cap is capable of adapting and improving its security there to deny the Ukrainians their ability to continue to pursue that active avenue approach. That was uh, defense analyst Henry Boyd. And still to 
come on news now of what was one of the world's greatest undiscovered shipwrecks is identified on the Antarctic seafloor. There have been tens of millions of people that have looked at these pictures and videos on the internet today. There is a, a mystery, a wonder, an excitement this stuff. This is exploration. This is human beings using technology. This is human beings exerting themselves to their very limits to try and find out new things, to unveil treasures, to learn about the seabed, what lies beneath. And the latest headlines from the BBC newsroom. Ukraine says Russian forces have bombed a maternity and children's hospital in the southern port city of Mariupol, injuring a number of people. Moscow has, for the first time, admitted that conscripts have been used in the invasion of Ukraine. And Western officials have expressed concern that Russia could deploy non-conventional weapons as the conflict continues. You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Marshall, and this is NewsHour. Britain's ambassador to Ukraine has described the Russian invasion as a horror show, and so she fears for embassy staff who are now fighting for their country. Melinda Simmons, who's been in post since 2019, finally left the country on Monday for Poland, citing growing tension even in the western city of Lviv. She's given her first interview to my news hour colleague, Tim Franks, who's currently in the Viv. He spoke to Melinda Simmons down the line to the Polish capital, Warsaw. First, why had she decided to pull out of Ukraine? Lviv was um, a very comfortable place to work from until martial law was declared. I would say that once that happened, it was like a, a switch had been flicked. Overnight, roadblocks started to go up. Those roadblocks began to get more extensive, fortified. The people who were managing them all began to be carrying weapons. They were very smiley and there was lots of Slav Ukraini in the first few days and then that actually shifted perceptively to a slightly more aggressive stance. A lot of people uh, in sort of, sort of self-designated cars stopping you and asking for your uh, ID if you didn't look like you were going anywhere purposeful. None of this is particularly, you know, directly threatening, but all an indication, along with the fact that all shops were closed as a result of martial law and were boarded up, and looked boarded up in a way that suggested um, potential concern about the um, suggested that Lviv was increasingly difficult a place to stay. We took a judgment that that we should pull back before it became a major security concern to be there. And yet, you will be aware it comes at a price because it's hardly a, a vote of confidence. It's hardly going to be seen as a vote of confidence by people in Ukraine, the government in Ukraine, as to the progress of the war. Well, I don't agree with that, actually. I think that, uh, for one thing, the UK has been among the countries that has done huge amounts, both in the run-up to this and now a new blog convulsive, you know, nearly three weeks. I know from the regular, the daily conversations I have with government representatives of Ukraine how deeply appreciated that is. Of course I want to be inside Ukraine on British ambassadors to Ukraine, but I also don't want to be a burden to Ukrainian authorities should there become security challenges. I note that there were ambassadors who stayed in Kiev through the bombing, and those then had to find emergency convoys to leave the city. I do not want to be in that position. That sort of help needs to be reserved for the Ukrainian people. And in the meantime, my job here is to make sure that I can continue and my staff can continue to help British nationals from the other side of the border for me to keep my political contacts going and those conversations going. And I don't think there is anyone in the Ukrainian government that doesn't understand that. You say that British support has been deeply appreciated, and I'm sure that it has to an extent, but you will also be aware that the Ukrainians will say, we appreciate what's been offered so far, but it could go so much further. And that we are fighting this fight almost with one hand behind our backs because of the limits on military aid. How far do you understand their frustration? So the military aid corresponds to what's asked of us. And where there are things we can't provide, we work with others to see if they can provide it. Of course it's going to need to go further, not least because uh, the harder, if you like, Ukraine fights, the more Russia may put into the mix. And therefore, you're talking about an endlessly evolving range of ways in which the UK and other countries need to and is looking to support Ukraine. So, 
the provision of military aid continues. The work on sanctions is also an ongoing and a building thing. And what about on the economic side? I mean, again, there's been a great sort of clamor about how the West is decoupling from the Russian economy. Britain would like to claim a leading role, and yet the Foreign Secretary admitted yesterday in Parliament that compared to the EU, compared to the United States, Britain has been far slower in sanctioning Russian oligarchs who've made London a second home. What are you saying to your Ukrainian friends about why Britain has been so slow on this? Well, again, this is a conversation that precedes the invasion. The United States World Order was one of several world measures that was put in place over the last few years in order to try to do something about this. And what she said is, is right, what we've been discussing in Kiev for a long time, is that those measures have proven just too slow. And what this invasion has done is impressed upon more of the right people that it needs to move more quickly, it needs to go more broadly and more deeply, and that is what is now happening. Give me the other thing where Britain stands out, and it stands out not in a terribly flattering way, is the reception given to Ukrainian refugees. I mean, two million people have been displaced by this fighting over the borders. Other European countries have opened their arms and said, you know, just come and live and work for in the EU state for three years, no questions asked. Britain awarded 760 visas. I mean, it's, it's pretty shameful, isn't it? Look, I crossed that border two days ago and uh, have never seen anything like it. Right? This is a humanitarian situation that is increasing exponentially and the sight of thousands of people ditching their cars and walking towards the border with their, their kids wrapped in blankets is a thing that, uh, even in the context of what, what was put out and open source right up to the invasion, something I don't think anyone, anyone could have foreseen. But there is absolutely no question of every part of the UK government being pleased with how we help. It's absolutely right, but at the moment it's struggling with capacity. I don't think we should confuse capacity with intent. The Home Office has made really clear that they are looking now to expand so that they have enough staff to be able to process the application. I think it was something like 10,000 within that first week. Um, and now they're looking to be able to staff it up so that they can move those applications along. Yeah, but the, the rules that the British government has set are just that much tougher than everybody else. I mean, it's vastly more difficult to get that visa. It's that that people here in Ukraine, they, they find incomprehensible. Well, those are the uh, security-based considerations that the Home Office seem to be important. The Home Office is part of the uh, cross-government conversations about what's needed to be done. For the moment, the challenge that they've got is that for as long as those requirements are there, this capacity has to be able to to be able to process them in real time. So, uh, let's see. I mean, obviously I've been talking to you as Her Majesty's Ambassador, your Britain's representative in Ukraine, but if I could just ask you maybe a slightly more personal question. You spent, as you mentioned, two and a half years in Ukraine. I know you speak for Ukrainian. You know, you, you're recognized on the street in, in Kiev, even in, in Lviv. Just what it means to you personally that this country has been invaded, pummeled, ravaged, and that actually there could be a lot worse to come. What does it, what does it mean to you? Well, I don't think there are really words to describe it. It's a horror show of the kind um, that, to put it into words, even reduces it to something banal. We have colleagues in the embassy who are fighting now. We have uh, several colleagues in government. And in business, and I have friends, who have men and women who have left their jobs and picked up guns and it terrifies me to think of what might happen to them but um, other jobs to do hit him and I have to put those feelings aside it's my job to help this country do what it has always wanted to do which is to live peacefully to be left alone to grow itself to be strong that's my job I'll keep doing that job that was uh, Britain's ambassador to Ukraine, Melinda Simmons, now in Poland, speaking to news as Tim Franks, who's in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. You're listening to the BBC World Service. This is news. Do stay with us. More to come in the next 30 minutes.